Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live event. I am Inma Borrella, the academic lead of the MITx MicroMasters Program in Supply Chain Management, and I am here today with my colleague, Paulo Sousa, who is lead of Supply Chain Analytics course, and with our guest speaker, Arturo torres the CEO and founder of Pentagium Data Consulting. Over the next 45 minutes, we'll dive into the major trends in data analytics, explore their impact on supply chain management, and also discuss how you can stay ahead of the curve by upskilling yourself. First, Paula and I will briefly introduce the MicroMasters program in supply chain management. Um, very convenient option to improving your knowledge and skills in supply chain management. Then Arturo will share the key trends that he has observed in the enterprise analytics space, and he will illustrate each trend with examples, which we're really looking forward to, to see. All right. That's the plan. So, Paulo, would you like to start by introducing the Supply Chain Analytics School? For sure, Ima. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. We have um, many learners connected with us now, but we also have many people that may be joining us for the first time. So this is indeed a great opportunity to introduce SC0X Supply Chain Analytics, which is totally related to our live event topic. So SC0X is the reference course for the MITx MicroMasters Program in Supply Chain Management. It is designed to equip you with essential analytical skills critical for supply chain systems. Um, this course covers fundamental mathematical techniques that form the backbone of supply chain decision making. Throughout the course, you will explore five comprehensive modules. In module one, we start with an introduction to supply chain management, data management, and analytics basics. Uh, this module lays the foundation by highlighting the importance of analytical models in making informed supply chain decisions. In module two, the course then delves into probability, teaching you how to apply probability functions and distributions essential for understanding stochastic inventory models, for instance. Next, in module three, you will tackle um, statistics covering topics like the central limit theorem, theorem um, hypothesis testing, regression analysis, which is very important for demand forecasting. Then optimization is the key focus of module four, where you will learn about linear programming, mixed integer programming, and other optimization models to solve complex supply chain problems. Finally, in module four, the course introduces uh, algorithms and simulation, providing you with some practical tools. By the end of SC0X, you will have a solid grasp of analytical methods necessary to op op optimize and manage um, supply chain operations effectively. You can enroll now in SC0X for free uh, by using the link that will be shared in the chat box. Uh, and as I mentioned, the course is part of the MITx MicroMasters Program in Supply Chain Management, which also offers other four courses. And Ima has uh, more information on the MicroMasters Program, right, Ima? Yes, I do, Paula. I have prepared a few slides. I won't take long. Um, but just to illustrate um, people to get a good idea of what our program is about. So the Supply Chain Analytics course is just the beginning of a comprehensive learning journey in supply chain management. Of course, if you're interested in analytics, start with SCTRX Supply Chain Analytics. That's the, the best place to, to start and build the foundations. The MicroMasters program in Supply Chain Management is a 100% online program that consists of five courses, the one that Paulo described and four more. All our courses are hosted on the ADX platform and can be taken from any device, your cell phone, your laptop, your tablet, as long as it has internet connectivity. The program is comprehensive and rigorous, providing the opportunity to learn graduate level supply chain content from MIT researchers. This is all the courses in the program and all the contents in each one of the courses. Of course, it's a, it's a summary of them. As you can see, the program covers a wide range of topics, starting with the fundamental supply chain models in forecasting, inventory management, and transportation, then continuing with network design, finance, procurement. Then we transition to strategy processes, global operations, and we finalize the program with data management, machine learning, technology, and systems. This would be more like an advanced, uh, the, the advanced analytics, like building on top of what you learned in ATC and very closely related with all the stuff that Arturo is going to be sharing with us today. 
As you can tell, the program is very comprehensive. Of course, it can't be covered in like just one month or something like that. Each course has a duration of three months, and it usually takes between 15 and 18 months to complete the whole program for an average learner. Something very special about this program is that it serves as a pathway for credit to a master's degree at MIT and over 20 universities worldwide. By completing the MicroMasters, you can then apply to MIT, and if, if admitted, you have the opportunity to earn a master's degree in just five months and at a fraction of the cost of a traditional master's program, which of course is a great opportunity. And you know, the program isn't just great according to us, it's our learners who back that up. And since launching in 2016, we've seen over a million course enrollments and more than 5,000 individuals from across the world have earned their MicroMaster credential. In this slide, you can see 4,800 credential holders, but this data from January, so now we added 250 more, so we crossed the, the barrier of 5,000 credential holders. Very happy about that. So that's a very brief summary of the program. If you're interested in getting more information about it, you can just see, click on the links that are shared in, in the chat, and there's a lot of information on our website. Okay, so now I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker, Arturo Torres, Torres Arpi, is CEO and founder of Vantageum Data Consulting. He holds a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from Tech de Monterey and a master's degree in supply chain management from MIT. Arturo was part of the 2021 blended cohort and he is also a MicroMasters alum, which means he passed all courses from the MicroMasters program like many of you are doing right now. We always like to remind the audience that one, just like Ima described, among many other benefits from learning this MicroMasters credential is that you become eligible to apply to the SCM blended master's program at MIT, just like Arturo did and to other universities around the globe as well. Before calling Arturo, I just want to recall that uh, as Ima mentioned, at the end of the live event, we'll be answering some questions from the, the audience. So during Arturo's presentation, uh, do not hesitate to share your questions through Zoom's Q&A feature. All right, so welcome back to the program, Arturo. The floor is yours. Thanks, Paolo. It is great uh, seeing you. It's great being here. Uh, thanks to all the participants that have joined. Uh, I see you've been seeing all the, all the messages. Uh, thanks, thanks to everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to give you guys uh, a bit of intro of uh, who I am. Uh, and why it is that uh, Paolo decided to invite me to talk with you guys about what are the trends that we're seeing nowadays in the world of enterprise analytics. So um, it's a bit of background uh, of me. I, as Paolo mentioned, I did the MicroMasters uh, back in the day. I was part of the first MicroMasters generation that graduated in 2017. I started doing the, uh, the SEX courses in 2015. So that was almost almost 10 years ago when, when, it all, when it all started. And then I joined the, the MIT Blended in, when did we graduate, Paolo? That was uh, 2020, 2021? 2021. 2021, Paolo and I studied together in Boston uh, during, the, during the spring semester. That was a great, great experience. I would highly motivate anyone that, uh, that wants to do a master's in supply chain to consider it. It is a fantastic experience. Um, other things uh, about me is that I'm the CEO and founder of Ventagium Data Consulting. We are a company based out of Querétaro, Mexico, and we do, we've been in business for like five, six years now. And what we do is supply chain analytics. And that is exactly what I'm going to be talking with you guys about. So I'm um, just going to go ahead and start with the presentation. So as any good presentation should, I'm going to start with a quote from Bob Dylan. The times are a changing, okay? Uh, there's been many, many changes. We hear it in the news. We hear it everywhere of how data technology is transforming the landscape of how enterprises are doing businesses. And sometimes it is only the very fancy, flashy stuff like generative AI and things like that that get all the attention. What I want to focus today on, on what are the real things, the real trends that are changing the, the way that companies are doing analytics nowadays. And to do this, uh, I went ahead and did an informal survey with many of our customers, many of our end users to check what are the main trends they've been seeing 
over the past 10, five years, even over the past year, the things that have changed that are helping them make better decisions all around data, okay? So just as a brief recap, uh, when we talk about enterprise analytics, we're talking about anything from the most basic data stuff. So all the data, uh, all your ERP systems, all the WMSs, TMSs, all the systems that a company uses to run their administrative and operational processes. Then we also talk about the descriptive analytics, which is all the business intelligence, the metrics, the KPIs, the reports, everything that the company uses on a day-to-day -day basis to understand what happened and why is it happening, what happened and what is happening. We also talk about diagnostic analytics. So not only, standing, not only seeing what happened, but understanding why it happened. Then moving on to more predictive stuff, like what will happen and more prescriptive analytics around what we should do about it. These, by the way, are some of the contents that are covered in the SEC or X uh, courses and in many of the other courses of the MicroMasters. The idea behind this entire journey of enterprise analytics is that companies take each one of their processes and move them across each one of these stages to be able to mature them into more of a, to become more data-driven around each one of their processes. The way this is done has changed dramatically over the past 10, five years. Uh, the way we used to do things 10 years ago is no way the way the, this is completely different to the way we do things now. And that is what I want to talk about with you guys today. We've seen well, five trends across the entire industry that are shaping the way companies do business with data nowadays. I think it's got a good idea to go uh, in depth into each one of these trends. And I'll try showing you guys some examples and some demos of what this looks like. And if you have any questions, just put them in the chat. Paolo will be helping me uh, get those questions and at the end, we'll be able to, to answer them. Apologies if I cannot answer them as we go, uh, but we'll get to them in the end, okay? So these five trends, one-stop shops for analytics. Number two, the democratization of data. Number three, local development. Number four, real-time analytics. And number five, the speed to insight. So the first one, one-stop shop for analytics. When we talk about uh, enterprise analytics, historically, it's always been a mess. The reason for this is that analytics tends to be very complex and fragmented. We have so many systems in companies. If you're in a company that has a strong supply chain, you know you have a system for your warehouse, a system for your transportation, an ERP system. You may have an HR system then all that data needs to be analyzed and it's analyzed by many different tools, uh, not only Excel, but many other different tools. So we're seeing companies put in a lot of effort into creating tools, well, not tools, platforms where you can do end-to-end -end analytics in one single place. 10 years ago, it used to be the case that to do proper enterprise analytics, for example, if you were working with um, something like Microsoft, you would have to go to the Azure Cloud to get some stuff, to Power BI to get other stuff, to the Power Platform to get other stuff. But nowadays, uh, Microsoft and all these companies are working very hard to integrate everything into one single space to simplify everything, okay? We see examples like Snowflake. You will kind of see these diagrams in all of these companies, you'll see similar diagrams well, in where they are showing how in one single space, you can do your data integrations, you can store your data in many different ways, you can do predictive modeling, you can do data applications, and you can exchange data with different partners. The same thing with Databricks, another company that is big in this space around data. You'll have uh, all your data in one single place and the possibility to do BI, real-time data, data science, machine learning, all in one single platform. This for us is proving to be uh, groundbreaking uh, because like when we started even five years ago, even when Ventasium started five years ago, we had to use 20 different tools maybe to do 
enterprise analytics for an entire company. Nowadays, uh, companies have uh, integrated everything into one single place. I'm going to be putting up many different Microsoft examples uh, because that is what I'm most specialized in. But this is, I'm just doing that because this is a topic that I know the most. But all the examples that I give, I know that are possible in other tools like Google or Amazon Web Services. But uh, here's, for example, uh, how it works with Microsoft. So for example, five years ago, when I started Vintage, uh, we used to have uh, things you know, on Azure AI and on Power BI and a data warehouse. And we use Synapse Spark. Uh, and then we had Data Factory. So all these different tools were scattered across different platforms. But now we have this like one-stop shops for analytics. The way that Microsoft name there is, it's called Microsoft Fabric, where you have all your analytics in one single space. Now, uh, enough of all this talking, uh, let's head over to my, uh, to my laptop to give you guys an example of what that looks like. So remember, uh, uh, like it used to be that you needed to into when to do like an end-to-end -end analytics project, you need to be running around with different tools. The cool thing about a tool like Microsoft Fabric is that you can have all your analytics, all your different workloads running on one single space. And by the way, I'm going to do a live demo. So if something fails, I'm just going to blame it on Microsoft, OK? But if something fails, you have to come up with some jokes as we uh, to, to entertain everyone, uh, OK? This is real data. This is real world, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is just an example of how uh, you, would have, you would run an end-to-end -end analytics process within a tool like Microsoft Fabric. So we have what's called a pipeline, a data pipeline. This uh, activity here, it will get data from the source, uh, from an on-premise source, and it will bring it to, to a lake house, to a data lake. Uh, lake house. Then um, we'll have a Python notebook that will clean the data. Then we'll have another notebook that will join these data with other forms of data. We'll have a notebook that will calculate demand forecast, uh, similar to what you guys see on SSCRX. Uh, so this, uh, this demand forecast, I'll show you in a second, but it uses many of those statistical concepts that you learned around time series analysis. And we also, uh, this notebook also updates the data behind all the dashboards so that you can visualize the data and all the different metrics, okay? So something like this, Back in the day, you had to run around if you're using, using different tools. But now you can go ahead and start running something like this. And you can schedule this to be run on a daily basis or whenever you want. And what this does, you will go through each one of these steps. It takes like three minutes to run. So I'm just going to fast track to show you um, what it is doing. Uh, so for example, it goes and gets the data. It brings it over. It cleans it. Let me show you some of the Python notebooks just to give you guys an idea of uh, what it is that those uh, notebooks do. So here, for example, on the first one, the one that cleans the data. So it loads the data from the lake house. It does uh, some cleaning with Python and SQL. And finally, it writes the data back to the next uh, step. But we can also do much more complex stuff. So we can um, automate many of the demand forecasts uh, that you guys saw on your different courses. For example, this one uses, uh, I think it uses Arima and Sarimax, which are time series analysis forecasts, demand forecast. And it runs through this entire notebook to come up with a forecast. So this, for example, are the sales across time. And it is running. This is how the 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 seasonality, each one of the the seasonality, the trend, and the residuals look like. And then we can come up with a forecast. So something like this, where we have the sales, 
and then we have a one step ahead forecast with the confidence interval. After all of this is run, this actually writes back the data over to the same space. So again, we have one single source of truth where we're writing, we have our raw data, we have our clean data, and we have our uh, demand forecast in one single space. So this is very, very powerful, okay? One-stop shop for analytics. Another um, trend that we're seeing is the democratization of data. It used to be that data used to be siloed across organizations. So accounting had their own numbers, finance had their own numbers, and logistics had their own numbers. And this is still the case, of course, in many companies. But what we're seeing now, the trend is more for uh, having data democratized and available across um, not only internal functions like finance and logistics, but also we're seeing more data sharing among the entire supply chain. So we know that the supply chain has three flows, the material flow, the financial flow, and the information flow. We're seeing a bunch more and more information flow across the entire supply chain. We're seeing more uh, sharing where customers share how much they're selling over to their upstream suppliers. And this is a trend across retail, uh, manufacturing, and many other different places. This is uh, done nowadays thanks to the uprise, uh, like the, the, the increase in not only in like EVI information, but also just the high availability of APIs across organization. This is the typical way in which data is shared across, uh, across the entire organization. Now, something that we really, really like is the concept of self-service analytics. It used to be that in companies, you had specific like data analysts, and those were the guys that had control of the data within each one of those functions. We believe nowadays, we can no longer have the luxury of having specific people within companies that are data analysts. We believe that now with the democratization of data, everyone should be up to an extent a data analyst. And this is of course something that a course like SEC or X enables because it allows you to understand data to make the most out of it so that you can really become much more data driven. Okay. And finally, uh, something that one of my clients mentioned that I really like is that the expectation around use of data has really increased. Uh, just for quoting a, a customer of ours, he was telling me like he, he felt that 10, 15 years ago, it used to be okay to run your company or your function by intuition. But nowadays, there's much more and more pressure to make your decisions based on data. And this, of course, enabled by all these different trends that make this data availability something much more attainable than what it was 15, 20 years ago. Number three, uh, the number three trend is the low code development. I don't know if uh, um, people here have heard about this trend, but when we, when we think about development, development of like systems and tools and uh, apps, we used to, Back in the day, we used to think only of IT departments or having to hire very expensive, specialized uh, consultants. But nowadays, the idea uh, is that many companies like Microsoft and Google and AWS have come up with different tools that allow anyone within organizations to do their own data, to do their own development. Okay. This allows for coding for everyone where anyone in the organization can come up with tools that can help the organization. And what we've seen is the more these tools come out, the less need there is for Excel sheets. We know 99% uh, of uh, supply chains run on Excel, but we see, we're see we starting to see this trend uh, change thanks to many of these low code tools that allow you to not only visualize, but also create data in ways that it's much more simple. This of course allows the time to value to be decreased because before you used to have to ask your IT department to come up to develop an app for you or to develop a website for you. But nowadays, if you can create your own apps, your own dashboards, your own BIs, then you become much, much faster whenever you need something.
So that is uh, something that has really changed the organization. Increases scalability. Uh, for example, if we have an Excel sheet that is used to run a very important process within a company, we know this is not very scalable, but we know we can transfer this, um, this Excel sheet to other platforms to increase to, for it to become scalable. And I'm gonna show you, uh, this by the way is the Google trend for low code platforms. So if you, you can see how starting 2016, there was like a massive uh, uptick in uh, the interest in Google around low code platforms. And I'm gonna show you a demo of what this can look like. So let's imagine for a second that you guys are the head of a function that runs different assets. Um, you have to run different properties and you're in charge of managing it. Traditionally, you would do this in an Excel sheet uh, like we've learned. But tools like Power Apps uh, now allow you to create um, apps without having to do uh, coding or development. So back in the day, if you had to do a website, let me just quickly go into the Vintagium website, you had to learn how to develop all these sort of code. Okay, this is, a, this is not a low code <laughs> environment, let's say. But now you can create your own apps with uh, very simple logic as if you are creating um, a PowerPoint. Quite similar to, if anyone here is familiar with Access, Power Apps is kind of like the replacement for Access files. So I can come on, go ahead. I'm gonna use one of these templates. And I'm gonna select this one that is called project management, sorry, property management. And these apps uh, are interfaces that anyone in your organization could use to make your processes much more robust so that everything can scale better than it does in Excel. We've always seen how Excel sheets can break and everything. Uh, this allows you for this allows for a much better control of those sort of thing. For example, this uh, automatically created this simple app that allows me to lease different properties, and I can, for example, re uh, lease a property for like three years under this name, blah 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 blah. blah. And I can go ahead and reserve this space. And all of these simple uh, interfaces, the way they are coded is similar in a way to how you would code in Excel, where you can where you can select something, the bar comes up, and the logic here, uh, all the logic behind these apps is done through these uh, this statement, this header, like you would do on an Excel on an Excel file. And all the different interfaces work in exactly the same way. And if I wanted to change this button and move it from here to here, I can just drag and drop without actually having to do code development. So this, of course, enables many, many different opportunities within organization to really take their processes to a whole new level, okay? So um, I say this is a low code environment because there's still some coding involved. There can be some things that can get complicated. For example, these things like this <laughs> do get complicated. Uh, but as you can see, it is not, it is readable code as opposed to something like this, where it can become very, very difficult to be able to handle something like that. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to the fourth trend which is real-time analytics. Uh, it used to be that back in the day to get real-time, real, real-time data, it was very expensive or almost impossible to get it. Well, nowadays there's many more platforms that allow you to have real-time data for, when, for wherever you actually need real-time data. You don't always need to have data updated to the second, but some decisions do need to be uh, made sometimes very frequently. And that this is where real-time data becomes very impactful. So some use cases, for example, in manufacturing could be connecting to PLCs, connecting to your machines to understand when machines break. Or in logistics, we could have um, 
uh, the GPS information helping us to uh, with security warnings or whenever there's a problem behind the wheel or we have a driver that's maybe falling asleep or something. It can also help us when we talk about IoT devices. If we put, for example, there's medicines that require logistics to be like cold chain. So uh, medicines that require to be uh, controlled at all times for their temperature. We've, we're seeing now customers where they put devices within the boxes to continuously measure the temperature of the medicine as it travels through the supply chain. That allows for uh, complete control of everything that is happening within the, within the um, logistics. And if anything goes wrong, the company can act very fast to make sure that we don't have any uh, spoil, uh, any medicines going bad or any food going go bad. No? So there's many examples in which this is now possible. Um, if I have time later, I'll show you a quick, uh, quick demo. Uh, but the fact that trend number five uh, is the speed to insight. And I'm just gonna close it up with this one. It used to be that doing projects where we talk about network optimization or simulation, which are the topics that you guys cover at the end of SEC or X, used to take months or years to complete. So in 2010, if you're doing an optimization project that require you to optimize your entire network, it could have to, we saw many companies that took them maybe six months to 12 months to come up with an entire network optimization. Nowadays, thanks to the low-code development, the data democratization, the one-stop shops for analytics, we're seeing optimization projects that can take weeks or days to go from all the way from the data to the more prescriptive stuff. So um, these are some of the things that are like, yeah, as I was saying, like some of the drivers and what this benefits is like, we can have much more experimentation. If things take days, uh, we can experiment many more things it reduces the cost of uh, doing optimization or simulation. We have, can have more broader applications and the decisions are based on up-to-date data uh, because it used to be that when you had an optimization project that ran for six months, maybe you were already using data that was six months behind. But nowadays, if you're constantly doing optimizations, you're using data that is up-to-date and relevant for the operation. So to conclude, Again, with Bob Dylan, the times are changing. Uh, as you can see, this is a very fast paced environment that is enabling a lot of transformation within, within companies. And if you guys wanna keep on learning more about these topics, I highly suggest uh, taking the MicroMasters, uh, the entire MicroMasters program. It goes all the way from the fundamentals, from SC0X to SC4X that has the technology and systems component of it. Uh, I've also, um, you can look at our website at the Vendation blog, where you can see different articles that my team has written about the topic about supply chain analytics. If you want to learn more about the tools that I showed some of the demos, I've added here a link to Microsoft Fabric or Microsoft Learn, and also a link to the Udacity website for data streaming. If you guys have any questions or comments, uh, follow-ups, uh, you guys can hit me up on on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me as Arturo Torres Arte. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you for a very insightful presentation. I think it was Thank fantastic you. the way you structured uh, everything in the key trends and also the examples were like great to really like understand what you meant like by each, each trend and how things are changing in the analytics world. Um, so I'm sure many people in our audience are wondering, in this era dominated by AI and machine learning, um, many companies pushing for implementing AI as soon as possible, not to be left behind. Do you still believe it is important to master basic analytical techniques like descriptive statistics, probability, and optimization. I don't think those are sexy concepts as, as of now. So do you think it's still important and why? Okay, and this is, you, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I did not use the words, I think I didn't, uh, I did not use words AI in my entire presentation. Uh, that was on purpose because 
it tends to be the flashy stuff, the trendy stuff. Uh, well, I, I did begin the presentation with that. I, I do see there's a lot of value on the fundamentals. I have a quick uh, slide here that I had prepared. Let me put it up for you guys to see. Um, the way that I see things, so when it comes to the AI, the flashy, fancy stuff, it is over here, okay? This is how I see things. It is not as applicable to all the different processes as the fundamentals. So the fundamentals that are you guys learning, like the students learning SEC or X, all what it comes with like the data cleaning, the descriptive metrics, the predictive stuff. These are the kind of things that were almost all processes within a company benefit from having um, these kind of uh, technologies applied, okay? But there's only very few processes where you can use Gen AI to help you within your company, okay? We're seeing many, I was talking with Jimmy Rose, which um, from Temper City last week, and he was telling me like, he's seeing a, a trend where people are looking for a problem that Gen AI can solve as opposed to be the other way around. Uh, we should look for, we should find a problem and find the correct tool, not find a, a problem for the tool, you know? And uh, the basic stuff like the data engineering and the descriptive, it, it applies to all processes. So it doesn't matter if you're in HR, finance, manufacturing, logistics, you need data, you need metrics, you need reports. Uh, you may need some forecasting for some processes. For fewer processes, you will need optimization and simulation. And even for fewer, fewer processes, you will need the current Gen AI stuff. So I think it's very important to learn these basics because it applies to 95% of the work anyone is actually going to be doing in supply chain. Okay, thank you, Arturo. I think that makes a lot of sense. And even like for many of the applications where you can go with, with AI, maybe you need to build on the other layers before, right? Before getting to that more autonomous way of running a, a process or like generating insights with, with, uh, with AI tools. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your vision on, on that. Sure. Yeah, great presentation, Arturo. Thank you so much. And you mentioned that one trend is one stop shop for analytics. So, so my question would be, um, what are the primary obstacles um, organizations face when moving towards a unified analytics platform? And if you have any recommendations on how to, to overcome this, is it infrastructure or maybe people skills or maybe change management? Because uh, there are a lot of people that love Excel, love Excel, you know, you can present many uh, different charts, tools, etc. But at the very end, some people, okay, but let me go with Excel. So what are the recommendations? How do you see it? And can I answer all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. It's it is, it is a good combination. I think number one, the change management, especially around IT. There needs to be a, a change. Um, like we always have to experience a change where IT has to let go a little bit and allow a little bit of a decentral decentralization of uh, the data. As we've seen, all these tools allow for uh, data citizens across organizations or your average uh, uh, people in the organization to do their own work. So there needs to be our change management on the IT side. There needs to be some reskilling. There needs to be uh, so that people go from just doing Excel to maybe learning how to do BI, then maybe learning how to do Python or SQL. So those would be kind of like my main two, my main two focuses were the things that need to change for in order for this to happen. So let's go with some question from, from the audience now. Um, Andres Vargas, he, uh, he mentioned that most companies are stuck in the descriptive analytics stage. So the very basic, the very the starting point. So in your experience, Arturo, what are the key levers that they can use to advance in the analytics maturity path and reach to some of the solutions that, that you have been sharing with us today? Got it. 
Good. So yeah, uh, back to also the original question that you were saying, Nima. For ninety percent of maybe eighty percent of your processes, you maybe no need. Uh, you don't have a need to go predictive. Maybe you are fine with just uh, doing the, the descriptive and made a diagnostic analytics around a metric. But there's many things like demand forecasting um, that do require to, for a process to be taken to the next level. So what do companies need to move to that level? First, make the first steps. We call this the analytics maturity because you need to mature from one step to the next one. Again, there's also a bit of reskilling involved because not everyone is trained uh, on building predictive models. And there's also a bit of mindset change management involved where a lot of the predictive stuff tends to be data science. So as it is science, there's a lot of experimentation. So for example, you may try to start predicting your orders on time, which order will be on time so that we can get ahead and change something and make sure that we deliver to the customer well, as we promised. But maybe you don't have the necessary information to predict this. So you have to be open to the idea that you have to experiment because this is science and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Great, thank you, Arturo. Yeah, we have another question here and before sharing the question, once I heard that today the speed of uh, innovation is faster than the speed of uh, adoption, right? So there are a lot of many new things out there in AI, uh, tools, et cetera, and you presented a lot of stuff uh, to us. So as you mentioned, the times are indeed changing. And there is a question here, any tips on how to stay up to date with everything that's changing and being created? So I I'll put it in another way. I mean, how do you do it, Arturo? How do you uh, are always aware of the things that are out there. Don't, don't sleep. <laughs> there, there's, there, there's no way of keeping up. Like, there's seriously no way of keeping up today with absolutely everything that's, uh, that's going on. What I personally do, so we've, we've uh, in Ventage, we've specialized, specialized, specialized around supply chain analytics, mainly with Microsoft tools. So I have, I have different resources, different newsletters, different blogs that I subscribe to, to keep up to date. And online courses, a bunch of different online courses and books and uh, things like that. I wish I could give you guys a much uh, clearer answer to this one, uh, but it's a combination of blogs, books, newsletters, and online courses. Great. Let's take, uh, what do you think, Paolo? We have time for one more question from the audience or a couple more. We're wrapping up. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There's so many questions. Uh, so much interest in the topic. Uh, so we have a question from Yuri Onishchenko. And uh, he says, hi, I'm a solution consultant. Leveraging self-service capabilities, how do you make sure people follow the same business rules? So they are not uh, reporting data in different ways, in different tools. It's great the democratization. I think the question is more like, okay, it's great. We democratize like the tool creation. Of everything is more decentralized. People are more empowered. But how do you make sure that everyone is speaking the same language? Got it. Um, this goes into how do, you do, how do you do data governance in an organization to make sure that we, even though data is decentralized, we can still have one single source of truth. So for example, if we're talking about how many open orders a company has, we need to make sure that finance, logistics, and everyone else has the same number in mind. In my opinion, there needs to be up to a point, uh, a bit of centralization where IT uh, or some specialized center of excellence uh, within, within any function can uh, make the first uh, the, say this, the centralized uh, data models, the centralized uh, starting points, let's say. So for example, the connections to the data sources, then the initial cleanup, and then they can create a table that has the open orders. And these, these can be kind of like the starting point for the rest of the functions. In data governance speak, 
there is uh, this concept of the data mesh where it's a way in which IT can implement uh, this sort of uh, data governance in a way that allows it for you to be uh, for it to be scalable. I'm going to write it down here in the chat if anyone wants to take a look at it. It's called data mesh versus data fabric. It's just concepts around how you implement good data governance strategies so that things can be scalable and we don't run into a problem where, again, everyone has their own version of the, of the truth. But that, again, is a question that I could talk about for an hour. <laughs> Thank you very interesting. Thank you for sharing those concepts. I think I'm sure they will be useful for the audience. All right. Do we have time for the last one, Ima? Yeah, let's go with the last one and then we can wrap it up. Okay. So um, there is one from Mohan. I believe this tools come with the cost. And so the question is, are small companies able to implement this? Because for like large companies, it's clear that they do have access to that. But does it work for small companies as well? Uh, I'm, gl I'm very glad they asked, they asked that question because I was going to talk about six trends and the sixth trend was going to be pricing. So again, uh, 20 years ago, to do this, you needed to be like a uh, Fortune 100, Fortune 500 company to afford having the team to support these sort of projects. But for example, a tool like Microsoft Fabric, it starts off at, and here I am sounding like a Microsoft salesperson, sorry. Uh, again, Google and AWS also have their own tools and they also uh, chip, but I know the Microsoft pricing. So Microsoft Fabric cost, starts around uh, $300 a month or something like that. And it gives you, well, by those $300, it gives you access to all of the things that I talked about. So it is an option nowadays to be able to do this. Storage is extremely cheap. For example, if you keep one gigabyte of data in a data lake, it costs like one or two cents per month. And so it can be very cheap to store data. What ends up costing you is the processing power. So that, that's where you pay the $300 uh, per month, or you, uh, and if you're a bigger organization, you can end up paying $5,000, $10,000 per month for the processing. Thank you, Arturo. I think we could keep talking about this topic for two more hours. <laughs> we need to, to start wrapping it up. So um, one last question, and this is from, from me, right? As someone who holds an MIT Micromaster in Supply Chain Management Credential, has graduated from the MIT Supply Chain Master's program, and is an entrepreneur, what key piece of advice would you offer our audience today? Uh, keep on learning. We've been granted the opportunity, uh, all of us, to have access to the internet and to have access to online courses. 30 years ago, this would not have been the option. MIT would not have been available to everyone in the world. So keep on learning, keep on doing these courses. Take advantage of what life has given us as, a, as an opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you so much. Thank you for an insightful presentation, for answering all our questions and staying a little beyond the hour uh, to do so. This topic is very relevant and timely. I hope our audience has enjoyed this event as much as we have. And uh, my key takeaway from your presentation today is that it is essential to stay ahead of the curve and be very comfortable with data analytics, right? Because we are getting access to more and more data and we need to be able to make sense of it to generate actionable insights, to drive better decisions in the supply chain space. Um, so as an immediate next step, of course, I encourage everyone to sign up for the MITx MicroMasters Program in Supply Chain Management on the EDX platform at edx.org. And as yes, you know, start skinning today and take your career to the next level. Paolo, what do you think? I think it's a great advice, Ima. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that you can find the links to enroll in the Supply Chain Analytics course or any of our MicroMaster courses in the chat box. As I mentioned earlier, our, our, cor our courses are free for everyone. One only has to pay the verification fee if one to become eligible to get the MITx certificate. Um, and yeah, this is it. So thank you so much, Arturo, for such a great presentation. Thank you, Ima, for co-hosting the live event with me. 
And a special thank you to the audience who joined us today. Looking forward to the next live event. Goodbye. <laughs>